when you get past a certain point of your own ego is that you realize that the joy is actually in the journey. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 418. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Professor Chris Pizzo. I'm Jeremy, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a guy who loves martial arts. Love it so much. We do two of these episodes a week, and you can find everything about these episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We never charge you to listen. We never put our old episodes behind a paywall. None of that stuff. All we ask is that you help us out where you can, when you can, and if you can. And the best way to help us out is to go to whistlekick.com, see the stuff that we've got available for sale, and maybe make a purchase. And if you do make a purchase, you can use the code PODCAST15, which will save you 15% off everything we've got over there, from protective equipment to uniforms to apparel. It's, it's all there. It's all there, ready and waiting for you. Back on episode 401, we tackled the idea of teaching martial arts for money. And it was a great conversation. And it was one of the first times that we've had a guest on to talk about a subject without having the, had the guest on to tell their story prior. Well, I thought it was an important discussion and I didn't want to wait. But here now we have Professor Pizzo coming back to talk about his journey through the martial arts and part of how he got to the place that he is now that's got him helping other martial artists, martial arts instructors in schools, see financial success in what they're doing. I thought we had a great chat. I really enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoy listening to it. So here we go. Professor Pizzo, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, Jeremy. I am so excited and so happy to be back talking to you, my friend. Hey, I am happy to have you here. You know, and that's, I get to, to welcome people all the time, you know, once a week, but I very rarely get to welcome people back. And it's something that's a lot of fun. And I don't want listeners to read anything into the fact that we don't have a lot of people back. I actually love most of the guests, but sometimes there are circumstances where we've got to bring people back. Now, if you haven't listened to our previous episode with Professor Piso, we talked about, well, what, in your words, because now I'm talking like eight sentences in a row, what? What, how would you describe what we talked about last time? So what we spoke about last time was really dispelling the myth that martial artists should not make uh, a, a, a good living, a good income, um, uh, based on everything from uh, the preconceived notions of the public to the nonsense that Hollywood puts out and, and things like that. Um, and we really took a deep dive on why it's actually so important for martial artists to be appropriately compensated so they can serve to their best of the ability. And we had a really good time. We did. We did. And that was back on episode 401. And of course, you know, you can find that easy enough. We'll link it in the show notes. We'll, we'll talk more about that stuff later. But it was, it was important to have you back because we hinted at, you hinted at some of the things that you had done. You had talked about running a large school and, and alluded to some of the things that you'd done in life, in your martial arts career that led you to being able to help people on that journey. But we didn't, we didn't go very deep into, into your journey. And I said, you know, something tells me this guy's got a story. So, you know, I poked at you a little bit and I said, Hey, let's have you back on. And you said, oh, okay, let's do it. And so here we are, we're doing it. And while the show isn't live. It's not going to come out today. Today actually holds a, a pretty special distinction that I didn't know until five minutes ago. Oh, that is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's well, well, I mean, not, not only is it my birthday, it's my, big, um, it's, my big four, it's my big 45th birthday. Yeah. 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 How are you feeling about that? Actually, I feel really good. You know, my father uh, passed away when he was uh, 59. Um, by my age, he had already had a heart attack and uh, double bypass surgery. Um, you know, not to uh, compare myself with with others, but listen, as martial artists, you know, we look and act 
younger. Um, I look at some of my friends from, from high school, from college, the ones that don't train martial arts, and frankly, they all look terrible. Um, you know, it's pretty, uh, I had some, uh, 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 19 year old girl the other day asked me how old I was. And when I told her like that, her eyes popped out of her head. So I feel pretty good, man. <laughs> I feel pretty good. That's fantastic. Now you've got a couple years on me, but I had a birthday recently as well. I turned 40 last month and yeah, I had a similar experience. I had a, had a couple women who were clearly younger. Oh, oh, it's your birthday. Oh, that's, you know, how, how old are you? And, and you don't get this opportunity too often. I said, no, <laughs> I, I would love, I would love for you to guess because I'm curious. And they guessed, I, one of them said 31, the other said 32. And I said, you know what? I'll take it. I'll take, you know, and, and they had, they had no motivation to lie to me. They weren't selling me anything. There was nothing, you know, I'm not going to see these people again. So yeah, I think there's something in, the way lifelong martial artists not only physically express themselves that makes us younger, but I think there's something in our personality. Maybe it's the fact that we're constantly trying to learn that is, is part of the secret of, of staying young. I don't, I don't know. We could probably do a whole other episode on that. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I hear what you're saying. It's definitely that we keep things. Well, it's like we were talking about last time, you know, it's one of the, 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 most valuable things we impart is that constantly learning, uh, constantly finding things that work well, constantly staying playful and testing things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that goes a long way as far as looking and staying young. So we're right there on the same, as always, Jeremy, you and I are on the same wavelength. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, despite it being your birthday, despite the fact that we've talked before, you know, I'm still going to put you through your paces. We're still going to talk about this martial arts journey that you've been on for a while. You know, I'm assuming that you being in the industry, helping people make more money, having run a school, you didn't start doing this last week or last month or, you know, I'm going to say probably not even 10 years ago. So if we go back to your origin story, what's that look like? When was that? So I started training when... I was five, um, you know, uh, one of my buddies, um, and it's funny, I was just, uh, uh, I mentioned to you, Jeremy, I was just back with my family, visiting family on the East coast. I'm in California now, I'm originally from North New Jersey. And we actually passed by the first karate school where I trained when I was five years old. And it was pretty cool. They downsized a little bit. I should have actually taken some time, gone in there and helped them. Uh, but, <laughs> but the time was crunched. So I started training there. Uh, I really wanted to go. Um, I trained there for, you know, 10 years, um, uh, um, with my sister and I, um, and, uh, but I really wanted to go learn, um, uh, judo and Japanese jujitsu and Aikijitsu at this place that was in the mystical, magical town of Westwood that, that seemed so far away. And my mom made it a big point to tell me that it was so far away. Well, when I got my license, I realized it was only two towns over. So, so I started going over there and, um, that, uh, uh, really started everything. For me. Um, and, uh, I, I trained, uh, hard, uh, multiple black belts, um, uh, changed and, and went and explored different martial arts. Um, but, uh, even when I went away to school and, and whatnot, uh, and then, in, uh, in, uh, 1993, um, when the ultimate fighting championship came out, one of, uh, our, my friends from the judo school disappeared for a few years. Um, and he turns out he came back over here to California, um, and <laughs> learned Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from, uh, Hoyler Gracie and came back and, uh, started teaching us at the judo schools from Jiu Jitsu. And, uh, I migrated over to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, uh, now my, uh, I, uh, that's primarily what I train in is uh, uh, judo and, and teach uh, judo and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So uh, I love it. Wow. Okay. Now you kind of glossed over the the multiple <laughs> black belts thing, and I and I suspect there's some humility in there. So I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick on you too much about that. But it's not a common thing. We recognize that as martial artists that 
while many of us, I don't even know that I dare say most, but many of us will do a little bit of cross training. You know, we'll we'll maybe, you know, spend a little bit of time over at this other school, this other style, or maybe we start with one thing, but find that our love is is somewhere else. But to make the commitment to put in the time, the years, the hours, blood, sweat, and tears, and some other cliches in order to earn a black belt, that's a big deal. So what were those other things and why were those other things? So there was, of course, starting with Taekwondo and Hapkido, um, then moving over to uh, Gojuyu Karate and uh, Daitayu Aikijitsu, and of course, Judo, um, and then Tekkenru Jiu-Jitsu, which is hand-to-hand combat, and then uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, um, and what's interesting, and the reason I oftentimes just kind of gloss over it, it, is that something I've learned, and I've been training now, again, I'm 45 today, um, I've been training for 40 years, and there's a lot of other my teachers, um, uh, uh, a lot of other people, I'm sure listeners that have been training even longer than that. And something that happens when you get past a certain point of your own ego is that you realize that the joy is actually in the journey, not in the, uh, the accomplishment of, uh, you know, getting a black belt or, or becoming a master or something like that. So the, the personalized journey of every individual martial artist is what's important. And so um, uh, I, I've, caught, I've actually caught a lot of flack from uh, certain egocentric martial artists that, oh my God, well, why'd you jump around from, from here to there to there? And, I, and it, it's not that, I, um, it's not that I, I got bored or, or that the teachers, you know, I ran out of things to learn. It's that my personal journey is individual um, and I go where the journey takes me. And when something starts to feel not right or wrong, I use that emotional guidance system to determine where to go next. Um, it's why even my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu journey, I started, uh, um, uh, the only reason I left the original, <laughs> my, my friend Lewis uh, back in New Jersey at Performance Jiu-Jitsu is because I did move to California. Even out here, I moved from Gracie Baja to Joe Moreira, uh, and now Brazilian top team. Um, uh, I, I'm still in contact with everybody. I love all those guys to death. Every single one of them has helped me. Um, it's just that at certain points in my life, I'm looking and finding certain elements that I need uh, for both myself and, and my uh, four boys at, the, at this point of my life. So, um, and, and I think that's just an important thing. It, I hope I didn't <laughs> gloss over <laughs> um, uh, uh, anything there, Jeremy. No, no, not at all. Now you, it, it sounds like you've kind of settled into, and I, I don't, I don't want to say settled, but settled into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu training. Are you still, you know, doing other stuff, or is that what has the majority of your time training now? So let's let's actually crack the egg open. Most most people, martial artists listening to this might actually remember me better by my former aliases in a previous professional life, which oh. was, oh. which was, which was <laughs> Lieutenant X or Captain, or Captain Chris. Um, and we can talk about that, that those businesses, because those were the largest martial arts publishing businesses in the world um, that I spoke about last time. We can talk about that, but even now, just to, to specifically answer your question, is why I have been here and why specifically judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, it's um, it's just who I am at this point in my life. Um, I it's funny though because some of the the lower belts are always telling me to stop using my my in quotes black magic. You know, I love when when uh, white and blue belts uh, tell me that hey, listen, you know, uh, all other martial arts are BS and this is the only real thing, and then I go out there and use all aikido on them. You know, I don't even use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And they're like, what is this black magic? I'm like, oh, you mean other martial arts actually work? Um, and uh, again, that goes back to that egocentric kind of justification. But um, I just like, um, you know, I, there, there's my body type, my physicality, um, uh, my, I guess, strategic kind of uh, uh, proclivity 
you know, I like uh, uh, board games and video games and, and, and chess and whatnot. Uh, it just gives me the opportunity to do that. Um, I, I, I'm still, you know, kind of a physical beast at 45. Um, so I like to, you know, get in there and, and, and bang a bit. But I, I, I'm at this point, I'm, you know, I have four boys, I'm married. Uh, my wife doesn't want me coming home anymore <laughs> with, with black eyes and whatever else. I have no uh, intent on becoming a professional fighter. So uh, jiu-jitsu and judo just gives me, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo just gives me that opportunity to go as hard as possible. And hey, you know what? If I want to train tomorrow and my 45-year-old body can take it because, you know, I, I dictated the speed. I dictated the technique um, and uh, you know, the best escape is tapping out when one of these world champion guys uh, get me in a position that I can't get out of. So I'm a, I always feel like I'm a control of, uh, of what needs to happen and I love it. All right. Now I, I was unfamiliar with the names Lieutenant X and, and Captain Chris, uh, but I have this really handy thing called a smartphone in my pocket. And as you were talking, I, I pulled it out, and you um, you are the subject of of many internet uh, conversations, my friend. Not only that, I've been <laughs> I, I've been you have entries on some some websites a, that um, would oh you, yeah that hate that they're hate writing me. about me. Yeah, um, I there's actually a book, uh, a marketing book, an advertising book. Um, that, uh, it's, it's very, it's actually very flattering. The book, um, it talks about how, uh, I gives my history in business and marketing and advertising in a, in a very, uh, uh, positive, positive light of who I mentored with, who I apprenticed under and, and how I'm, uh, not, not to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty much one of the only guys in this industry who knows how to actually get value for what we teach. But the title of, the, the title of that, 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 that chapter in that book is the most hated martial artist on the planet, right? Um, which is funny. And because, you know, for, it's one of the things that always drives me crazy. It's actually, and I'm glad we're talking about this because it's actually the thing that I've seen and isolated over the last 10 years of helping other martial artists what they're afraid of. They are so afraid of other people either saying critical things about them, um, calling them things like a fraud or a liar, or you know, that the martial art they know can't really work in a real fight, or all this other nonsense that 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 actually stops them from success dead in their tracks. And uh, you know, listen. I, I have some pretty successful businesses. Can those things be removed online? Can I take legal action? Can I take whatever else? Of course. But the reality is that there are always going to be naysayers. There are always going to be, if you are not willing to have people say bad things about you, then you might as well just lay in your bed and under your covers and, and die a slow death, right? Um, it, it's just not the way we work. The, the, the whole point of what we do when we talk about getting self-confidence and absolute focus and emotional control, right? Those are the real powers of martial arts, not about kicking someone's butt anymore, is the whole reason is that so you can move forward in your life. And like we were talking about last time, I mean, that's the values and that's the skills that allow martial artists to charge maximum dollars, right? It's not about the tactical component. Uh, it's not even really about the experiment, uh, experiential component. It's really about the transformational qualities that everything, the, the, the fountain of youth, we started also this conversation talking about, the emotional control, to be able to uh, uh, just not care or, or not even, or, or to live your own reality where you just don't care what other people say because the other the, the people that are saying the nice things that are in your circle of influence you are serving them to such an extent and they are so happy and everything is so positive that the rest of the world ceases to exist and and that's 
the key, I, I mean, that's the, the key to enlightenment, right? As martial artists to what we're all seeking for, so, uh, or mm -hmm. searching for. So yeah, there, but there's a lot of nasty stuff about <laughs> uh, 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 the, the, the way I was, uh, and, and listen, I'm gonna take responsibility. There is a, you know, when you're young and you're starting business and you're trying to do things, you, you learn from people, you take a lot of advice that maybe even though your gut is telling you not to do, you do anyway. Um, it, some of the things we talk about, uh, you know, the it's income is just not enough. You know, there's got to be that balance between income and impact. And sometimes when you're not being your true authentic self, then you, you go too far in one area, right? Um, uh, it's why martial artists either that uh, make a lot of money are either lambasted and online or martial artists that stay stay poor just you know don't wind up helping anybody so it's, it's an interesting phenomenon let's put it like that it absolutely is and what i find interesting is if the the only people who are lambasting someone online whether it's martial arts or any other industry if the one thing that those people have in common is that they don't have money and all of the people that they're attacking do have money that's probably your motivation right there. It's jealousy. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that people with money are, are infallible. That's not to say that people without money have no legitimate claims to, to or, or criticism is a better word. But quite often, it's just, it's envy. What's cool now is, perfect example is, um, a really great guy. He has a fantastic uh, school up in Long Island. Um, uh, he actually saw me speak at a, a, a NATMA conference um, uh, about a decade ago. And actually more than that, it was in like 2007. And he, I, I'm sorry, he didn't see me speak, but, but I was the talk of the town because I was the only person there that was not pitching anything. I was actually there to help people. And so even though, getting back to, even though you know, there's the people out there that have issues with themselves and they're projecting those issues onto other people, right? That's what you're talking about, Jeremy. Um, whether, whether it's money or style or technique or whatever it is, right? Whatever's up their butt that day, right? Their hats have given them hard, a, a difficult day. There are absolutely people out there that are responding to your message, are responding to your methods and you can't, everybody, ha every martial artist, especially martial arts instructors, just has to realize that they can't be everything to everyone. They cannot make everybody happy. So find the people that you're supposed to serve and work with and make happy and just focus and make them as happy as possible. And that will make you as happy as possible also. Where did these philosophies come from? Were these things you learned as you went or were they these things that oh, you man. had some guidance for? Um, I was a, so here's the big thing is you want to talk about professional journey is in 2010, my, uh, personal income was astronomical, uh, literally the 1% of the 1%. Um, we were selling about a million self-defense videos, nutritional supplements, uh, books and, and everything per year. Um, and it was just astronomical. However, personally, um, uh, I was the most miserable I ever was. Um, I had a track because I was so only money focused, I lost that balance. And that in turn had attracted this den of vipers. Um, everybody from big business to other martial artists that literally were only there to because they believed in taking advantage of other people, taking advantage of me, taking advantage of some of the other good people that worked for me, taking advantage of my customer base. We were all generally good people. And um, I had everything from uh, 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 anxiety attacks to I had to be hospitalized for um, some stomach problems that were stress related. And it was simply because I hadn't found that balance that we're talking about between income and impact. Was making more money than most people on the planet, still doing something I loved and I believed in, which is martial arts, but I wasn't doing it in the manner 
that I, that was congruent with my true authentic self as a teacher, right? I started my career as a high school teacher. It was my favorite job until that also had red tape <laughs> involved with uh, allowing me to really uh, uh, push the educational values that uh, the children I was teaching needed to, to survive in, in the modern world. And when I left there to, to start my own business, I kind of lost track listening to the wrong people again. Uh, and so again, after that, I had to, we moved to California, I sold and shut down everything I had, uh, and focused again, purely on my martial arts training. Uh, and, uh, that drove me to, uh, uh get involved with, uh, the, the largest Brazilian jiu-jitsu franchise in the world. They had some problems with their headquarters. They asked me to come on, buy the school, fix it, make the decisions, the hard decisions they couldn't make implement my processes and my programs and, and my marketing and my business knowledge to it uh, like I have for everything else. Uh, and, and to answer your question, just that journey started to show me where the mistakes I had made in the past really were. And, uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes, everybody in their personal life and their professional life. Um, you know, it's part of the journey. But if you don't learn from those mistakes, if you don't learn from your history, then you make those same mistakes over and over. Uh, and so I, and there were a few mistakes I made over and over, but I learned from them. And each one of them, I noticed where that mistake was and what I had to do to fix it and uh, sought out either the best teachers, the best mentors, again, uh, in different areas of personal development and professional development and uh, really rebuilt myself over the last decade into not only someone that I am genuinely happy as a person, but someone that's there for my family, uh, my kids, my wife, most importantly, all the students and clients that I serve. And, uh, you know, both on the professionally and philosophical, philosophical side, because yeah. it's, it's not enough. It's not enough just to want to make money. And it's not enough just to live the life of a poor martial artist philosopher. You have to find that balance. Now, when you were, you were plugging along and, and, you know, as you said, the money was good, but, you know, not much else was. You made a conscious decision to abandon that and to reinvest in martial arts. I, 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 I'm, I'm hearing That's you correctly, exactly right? right? That's what you said. Okay. That's exactly right. That's the reason I'm the, so everything was so, and when I mean the money, I, I can't stress enough. I had um, even some of my uh, uh, accountants and lawyers, whatever else, I had the, an eternal ATM machine. It was literally, I could send out uh, you know, a, a message in, and in five days, you know, three quarters of a million dollars come in. Um, you know, literally it, it, it was that powerful that, that I had built based on, you know, everything that I had learned and done and whatever else. But yeah. Okay. So when my health, my mental state, my, uh, even my, I was sad. I was just sad. I, I, I looked, I considered even going back and just abandoning everything and being a teacher. And yeah, I consciously shut everything down. Okay. I just shut everything down and we moved to Southern California because this is, many consider this to be New Brazil, New Japan. Uh, there's more you know, professional fighters and martial artists per square inch out here than anywhere else in the world right now. Yeah. And I stopped everything and went and just trained martial arts for two solid years in between that. I watched and hung out with my kids and trained every single day. And that actually repaired my psyche, right? Everything that was wrong with me, my health, my mental state, everything was repaired through those martial arts. And, and that's when I realized, holy cow, you know, just showing people, um, you know, the general unwashed public who are not willing to get on the mat and train like all of us, um, that who was who my customer base used to be. Um, of course, there was a few good old martial artists uh, in there as well. But, um, you know, showing people shortcuts of self-defense or just the tactical side of martial arts is not the answer. The real answer is that martial arts itself, doesn't matter what style, 
doesn't matter, uh, you know, who your teacher was, what the lineage is. It doesn't matter if you have been consistently training, there's magic in there. There's magic. And it, it is what everybody in this modern world of Instagram, Facebook, tweeting, texting, everything, what they really need uh, to, to bring themselves and find their center and make them happy. And uh, I wouldn't trade, you know, uh, anything for, for what I've been through. So it was martial arts is the most powerful tool on earth. I agree. I completely agree. And I'm sure a lot of the people listening would completely agree. But here's the part I'm curious about. I, I, I don't, I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm absolutely not saying that at all. But I'm imagining you in, the, in that place, that place of success, that place of somehow realizing that it is not what you want. But you made a, some very big steps. And it sounds like, at least in part, you were betting that martial arts would be your solution. How did you know? Wow, that is a good question. Um, I didn't know. I, the only thing I knew, and this is so important, and again, Jeremy, it's such a good question. And, and the reason it's a good question, because as martial artists and martial arts instructors, this is what we really do, is we take the focus, right? Our martial arts teachers help us Take the focus off of what is not working and put it onto something that makes us feel better. You cannot go to a martial arts class where people are trying to punch you, kick you, choke you, throw you, you know, you're, whether you're doing push ups or drills or there's so much things going on for that hour or hour and a half, whatever your class time is is that the outside world ceases to exist and your focus is forced to be on the present, to be on the now. And that now is giving you direct and immediate feedback to whether something you are doing is working or whether something it is, is not, but it doesn't matter. You're having a good time doing that. And because your emotional guidance system, your feelings are telling you that this is fun then this, that is the right thing to do. And so I, it was an educated guess, right? But all I knew is that, hey, listen, when I go to jujitsu, I feel better. So at this point, you know, as I wrap everything up, everything, legal stuff, company stuff, you know, paying off uh, scumbags that I worked with to just get out of my hair, you know what I mean? Let me, in between all that, let me spend as much time as possible, both me and my children, right? Because then I go and help teach their classes also. Just spending something that makes me feel good. And what makes me feel good was jujitsu and martial arts. And, uh, you know, that consistency of, uh, you know, months and months and then years and years of getting really, really back into it, it wasn't about me becoming some sort of world champion. It was just about me doing something that made me feel good. And that fixed me. That, that honestly, God honestly fixed me physically and mentally. And, uh, and that's, honestly, that, that's what I try to impart to other martial arts instructors now, right? Looking at what I've done in the past and bridging the advertising, marketing, and business to with the real power that martial arts has. And again, every martial artist who's been training for <laughs> over five years knows this and has that same power and never ceases to amaze me. Mm. It's a pretty powerful story. And what it's, what's interesting about it is that we haven't heard a lot, but we've heard it a couple times and, and I'm not going to call anybody out. I'm not going to name names, but longtime listeners, there, there might be one or two people that you're, you're hearing that, you know, there's some similarities in there. And what I find interesting is, you know, it's, it's not about money. We've, we've heard a similar story from plenty of people who have no money, that just something in what they were doing, they felt the answers were, were there somewhere in the martial arts. And so they found a way to invest even more time. Not everyone was training seven days a week, but they found a way to train more. And they found a way to find those answers 
within the four walls, you know, and I, a lot of people use the term dojo generically. I don't do that, but you know, within their training hall of choice, the answers were on the mats, so to speak. I remember one time I was uh, myself and and Master Joe Moriera. Him and I were teaching a class, and there was so. This was right in the middle of uh, this was probably circa like 2013 or something like that, and. Uh, I was so close to the end of putting my past life behind me and something triggered that day, just, just literally it, it, it hit me like a falling piano, like uh, just stress and, and this and that. And I'm, I get on the mat and Joe looks at me and says, what's the matter with you? And I, I tell him, he goes, oh, there's no time for that nonsense. Now it's jujitsu time. And he was absolutely right. And for, you know, that, that, for that hour, I was his man dummy and he, he choked me out. I couldn't, so many times I couldn't lift my head for a week, but just that little bit of guidance, right. From somebody who, you know, was, was such uh, history and accolades and, and has been training for so long, that little bit of guidance meant everything to me. And the rest of my day and the rest of that week allowed me the the freedom to refocus and get the things done that I needed to do. And, uh, you know, that's the, the big takeaway here for everybody is that the rest of the world doesn't know this. Like we take it for granted, but, but everybody else. And, and it's so funny because we all talk to our friends, you know, about, and they all know we're all martial artists because that's all we talk about sometimes. And they, they they always say, Oh yeah, I'm going to come by for a class and I'll try it out. And, you know, how do you stay in good shape or how come you seem so cool and calm, you know, and you, you talk about this stuff and, and they never show up and they never do it because no martial artist, especially martial arts school owners, instructors ever talks about those real problems. They talk about self-control and self-confidence and physical fitness and, and uh, you know, fighting ability, but they never talk about the actual bleeding neck problem which is people need, especially in this day and age, they need emotional control. They need focus. They have problem doing that. And that's what martial arts does. And that's what it does for all of us. And that's how come as experienced martial artists, there is the opportunity to make a very, very, very good living. Not so you can buy crap like yachts and Ferraris and stuff, right? but so that you have the freedom con to continue your journey, like you just said, Jeremy. So that, that's really, really important. Hmm. I wish, and, and I don't get political on this show very often. This might be the first time ever. And I'm being very specific. Anyone who chooses to read anything into this statement, you are doing so likely out of your own prejudices. I wish money had less stigma in the world because it is a tool. It's, it is the only store of time, the store of knowledge, and it can be used in such wonderful, wonderful ways. You know what I found fascinating? Um, during my journey, right, um, there was a point where I was very satisfied and uh, I was doing some, uh, you know, I was helping the martial arts schools and whatnot, but I was making the bulk of my uh, income for my family um, through consulting with like wealth management firms and real estate investment firms to, to utilize my, my marketing and advertising business background. And um, <laughs> I found that the highest suicide rate is actually among billionaires. Um, you know, I, you can argue that, well, there's not a whole lot of them. So, you know, it just seems like it. But, but the reality is that what you just said about the stigma, it's not enough just to want to make a lot of money, right? It's not enough just to want to make a lot of money doing what you love. You have to find that balance, like I said before, between income and impact. Because it's like food and water, right? Your you, money is like water. If you don't have it, right, you, you won't be able to, to buy your necessities of life, right? You won't be able to survive. But if you don't have the impact, that's like food, right? You, cannot, you, you can't survive 
you know, I don't remember what it is, uh, uh, but you know, you can't survive for more than 24 hours without water, right? But you can survive a week without food. It's the same thing. You can't survive without income for a short time, but in the long term, if you don't have that impact, you're going to die of starvation. And so finding that balance, right? And that, that's why I love working with martial arts. Everybody's like, you know, oh my God, you know, martial arts, everybody's behind the eight ball. The entire general public has these, these preconceived notions of what martial arts do, who they are, you know, and that doesn't have any place in the modern world. And I say, yeah, but you know what? They have, they understand that balance. And if they can impart that balance onto other people, then they will understand that also. And yeah, we'll make the world a better place. So it's a, it's a big thing, you know, that both the stigma about money, but the, also the misunderstanding that money isn't everything because I had all the money in the world and it was the most miserable I ever was. I, again, I, there was a couple of times during that time where I just wished I was just back being a poor school teacher again. Right. But now that I have been through the journey and I'm helping other people, I uh, have the income and the impact in my own life. I clearly see, and they clearly see as well, that that is the answer to have that balance. And it's you, just like martial arts is a personal journey, right? How much income and how much impact everybody has is totally up to them, right? Jeremy, you have a world-renowned podcast, right? There's, you know, your impact is massive, right? Some people don't want that kind of impact. So everybody needs to find where they're supposed to be and what feels right and then stabilize and then there's obviously going to be different points in everyone's life where, you know, what's good today might not, you know, they might want something different tomorrow. So it's a, it's a always a forward moving journey. That's really what it comes down to. I agree. I agree. Keep moving. We're, we're not necessarily sharks, but you know, if we're not moving forward, we will stagnate and stagnation. Ugh, might, I'd, I'd rather die. Yeah, <laughs> I really would. Now it's clear that martial arts is, you know, more than a part of your life, it's, it's part of your DNA on such a level that I, I suspect we couldn't even speculate what life would look like without martial arts. So let's, let's kind of take the, the easy way to answer a, a question I don't often ask, which is, what else do you do? What else is in your life? You've talked about family, you've talked about your training. Do you have other hobbies? Are there other things that you're passionate about? At this point... No. Um, martial arts and the business of martial arts is everything in my life. Um, you know, my, uh, I have four kids, I have four boys and, and my wife um, and uh, my family, extended family went on. Obviously, they're very important to me, but it, it, my clients a lot of times got to call me on it that I prioritize uh, it's call it selfish, call it, you know, whatever you want. But I actually prioritize the business of martial arts over everything else in my life. Um, it's what I read about. Uh, you know, I, obviously there's a, a different tangents of personal and professional development that you need to explore. You know, I, I read an immense, we talked about before, you know, my wife gave me a, uh, for my birthday, gave me a biography of Stan Lee. Right, um, the, the the crafting of stories of Stanley from Marvel Comics, right, of how that in that business like that fascinates me because it is directly translatable to what we do to help other people. Um, you know, my kids. Uh, it's funny because they're they growing up with a father who's a professional martial artist, um, and I and I, I've asked a lot of other. <laughs> martial, uh, martial arts dads, uh, instructor dads about this also because all of our kids don't seem very interested in it because they know it's always going to be there. So my boys are just obsessed with football and they're all phenomenal athletes um, and they're, you know, just so good, but they don't understand that the reason why they're so good is because they started martial arts when they were young. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I, you know, it's, it really is. I mean, I, I, there's other things I like surfing, um, you know, and, and, but it, it's, it, I spend all my time reading and working with martial arts clients or train, doing my own training or my own education. That's all I do. Um, it, it's, 
you know, even, even it's funny. I, I, I make the joke all the time. Uh, if it wasn't for martial arts, I would never work out. Right. Like I go to the gym, you know, and do things because, you know, I, I want to be able to beat the 23 year old muscle head who, who walks in. Right. And my technique is good, but it's not fantastic. Um, uh, so I still need to stay somewhat strong. Um, but if it wasn't for, for that, there's no ego anymore. I don't care how I look. Right. But if it wasn't for martial arts, I, I want to perform to a certain level because it makes me feel a certain way. And that way is good. And when you feel good, good things happen, you know, like begets like. So it's very, very important. It's true. It's true. Now, let's say tomorrow we wake up and I hand you a ticket, a ticket to train with any martial artist anywhere in the world, anywhere in time. Who would you spend that ticket on? Jaguar Kano. Um, as a, um, as an educator, um, first and foremost, I think that um, the way he disseminated all the styles of Japanese jiu-jitsu in a time where it's actually very similar today, the 18, 18, late 1800s, very similar to, to today in that the times became so modern that the usage for the tactical usage for hand to hand combat kind of uh, was no longer needed. Um, you know, uh, uh, that with trade agreements with uh, uh, the Dutch and the English, uh, even America with guns coming over, you know, the, the Japanese quickly realized hey, listen, you know, we need this. There's something to this stuff, right? There's something to this that needs to be preserved. And, you know, we're not going to be able to use this against a, a machine gun. Um, so there's something, though, to this, not only culturally, but also mentally, spiritually to this. And Jigoro Kano, as a doctor of education, disseminated it down and developed uh, judo as a method of education, not only for physical education, but of moral and spiritual education. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to pick, you know, um, because then, then the line from Jigoro Kano to Mitsu uh, Maeda to then, you know, uh, the, the, the Gracie family even, you know, but it's all goes back to, to, uh, Jigoro Kano. So that's who, what I would love to train with, to learn from, to sit, to apprentice under and mentor because he changed the world, um, uh, through martial arts culturally, physically, as an Olympic sport, um, spreading the culture uh, of uh, his, his uh, descendants all over the world. So, you know, that, that's absolutely who. I think that's a great choice. And the more that I learn about Kano, the more I think he occupies this legitimately unique place in our history in that I think he is the only martial artist that if we were to remove from the timeline, there would be a substantial change in what was done and where and how. I, I agree not only wholeheartedly, but based on some of the research that I've done, I would, some, would argue that it, it would, the cultural fighting arts of Asia, even be around today. If it wasn't for him, because it, it, it wasn't just him, there was also his contemporaries, right? He was just, you know, the, the most um, uh, uh, widely accepted because of his uh, uh, connections in the educational world of Japan at the time. But, uh, you know, if reading his, his books and his papers and whatnot, it was definitely a mastermind principle going on. You know, it's not like he created judo to fight those other uh, jujitsu schools. It's like he, he consulted with them also. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing. I, I'm, I would venture to say that martial arts would not be here without him. Mm. Um, Eastern martial arts, at least. I, I think we might be looking at more like the Filipino martial arts that are just now starting to get some traction. And, and you know, anybody who hears that seems says, no, no, there, there are plenty of people doing Eskrima, et cetera. Yeah, there absolutely are. But compare that with the numbers of people doing karate 50 million plus globally taekwondo yep. 70 million plus globally it, 
those numbers wouldn't be the same. No, absolutely not. So yeah, yeah, it's a great answer. It's great, great choice. One of the things we haven't talked about today is competition. And you being a, a BJJ practitioner now, certainly competition is kind of deeply rooted in the way that you practice Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So is that is that something you've engaged in? You you stepped out on the mats and yeah, you know, I rubbed uh, your smelly armpits and strangers' faces. Yeah, I I actually used to compete quite a bit in judo, um, and um, and then when I first got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, quite a bit. Um, I never really. I, it, it makes people laugh when I say this that that I was never really a phenomenal athlete, and I, I tell that to the guys at the at the gym, and they're all like, "What are you talking about?" But it, but it's true. I, I mean, and at this point in my career as a martial artist, I've trained with pros, like real pros, uh, pro fighters, pro uh, uh, Olympi- Olympians. Um, you know, there's a, where I used to train judo was uh, uh, in back in New Jersey, both north and south. You know, everybody from uh, Mike Swain and uh, and then Jimmy Pedro is up in Massachusetts and you know Jason Morris is up in New York and uh, Aliko Ogasawara uh, like they're they're all there you know and and there's a difference and, and I'm good friends with Roddy Ferguson and and you lock up with those guys it's like you realize quickly that you're just a high school quarterback playing with an NFL quarterback and it makes you and it's, it's a hard thing to I think to admit, um, but everybody has their place, right? Everybody has their, their journey again. And so many people I see place so much emphasis on competition for what, right? It's one thing if they're trying to do it as part of their journey to prove something to themselves. It's another thing if they think they're going to actually get something out of it. Um, you know, it wasn't until recent years that there's any money whatsoever in MMA. Um, and I, I actually don't even watch MMA anymore because it, it, it has turned into, uh, and I'm not judging. I mean, it's, it's a sport. I don't watch, you know, if it wasn't for my kids, I would, would not watch football either. You know, um, it, it's just not, you said before, it's not in my DNA. Um, but I like competition again, to just reframe it. I like competition when it's for the individual, when you want to prove something to yourself, when you want to test yourself and see where you're really at, that's what it's for. But I see way too many martial arts instructors that are constantly, especially in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They're constantly pushing their students to compete, be like like that actually is going to dictate something. Um, there, there's a lot of different schools of thoughts on uh, on that, but um, you know, considering that I started my journey really in a Olympic judo training center. And then when I moved over to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with the, one of the guys who was the best guys in the Judo Olympic Training Center, and he uh, didn't place any emphasis on competition, but plenty of people still competed and win, won from his school, it really showed me that ah, it's up to the individual. Everything about martial arts is up to the individual. If you want to compete, compete, but don't expect the world to then bow down at your feet about, you know, because you won some medal or, you know, Olympic gold or, or, or that, right? Um, it, it's, it should be and should always be for yourself. That, that's just the way I feel about it. We also haven't talked much today about martial arts culture. We talked about you making some good money selling some books and some DVDs, but we didn't talk about you know, martial arts flicks or, you know, you staying up late to watch Kung Fu on TV or anything like this, you know, it was that part of martial arts for you. Yeah. So here's the big difference. And I tell this to, to, to everybody and everybody gets it also is those of us and, uh, you know, Jeremy, you're, you're not much younger than I am. So you, you, you fall under the same category. You know, you remember back to the eighties, right? That was the golden era of martial arts media 
everything from the Karate Kid to Chuck Norris to Ninjas to the Ninja Turtles to Steven Seagal and uh, Van Dam, right? And and you just could not turn the corner without uh, uh, running into something um, and that that was martial arts based. It was you know the the, the sorcery of our of our childhood. Uh, for those of us that were that were interested in it, and so yeah, that was a big part of it, right? Um, and the big changeover that I see today is that, unfortunately, well, not is that because of that media blitz in the eighties, seventies and eighties, late seventies and eighties, is that martial arts changed over from being a way of life to being just a a activity, right? Something to do. Um, and of course, there's all those those of us that stuck with it, but most people, uh, you know, in the U.S. have taken some sort of uh, karate class or something sooner or later, um, and they don't stick around. And the reason being is now, if you look at it, there is none of that, right? I mean, there's MMA, which is a professional sport. Nobody, I mean, there's on one hand, every man at least thinks he's a thousand more thousand percent more effective in a fight than he actually is but at this stage of the game in mma anybody sane can't you know you can't look at those professional athletes uh, in in that cage and be like oh i could get up there and do that if you are not some sort of accomplished athlete already you know um and but that's all we have i mean kids go in and they watch you know i listen i love marvel movies and i love the avengers and spider-man whatever else but they come in, they, they go in, watch that stuff, and they come out not saying, hey, I want to go learn how to do that. They want to come out and be like, oh, man, if I had a billion dollars, I could be Iron Man. I don't have it, so I'll just go play Fortnite. Um, you know, they, they, they don't say, um, you know, Captain America works hard um, and learns everything. No, he got in with this super steroid injection of super soldier serum, right? Oh, if I only had that. So... It's a different mentality now. Um, you know, thank goodness that there's still a, like John Wick movies are awesome, right? Um, and I'm, you know, surprised that the John Wick movies haven't driven more people to martial arts schools. But uh, I, I think that because those movies are, are geared towards an older audience, um, that there's this misconception uh, that that people feel, oh, I'm too, I would be awesome to be able to do what John Wick does, um, but I really don't see the point of, of it because I'm not a professional hitman um, because they don't understand everything we were just talking about, Jeremy, with enlightenment and focus. Um, and also the big thing is that everyone makes the mistake that thinking that, uh, oh, I'm too old to start, you know? Um, so yeah, but martial arts media had a big impact on me in the 80s, just huge. And it's funny because all my friends are martial arts instructors also. So <laughs> evidently, you know, we all find each other. Yeah, there's certainly something special about that martial arts media, you know, whether it's the 80s or, you know, once in a while we find the good stuff. You mentioned John Wick, those films. That just pulls us together. It, it, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and their version of martial arts culture, and I'm using air quotes here, is they go train. And then they go watch a movie with other people that they train with. Yeah, it's um, I I believe that while everything from yeah going what you know watching movies with each other of the the brotherhood or sisterhood right <laughs> whatever it is the camaraderie of martial artists of of everybody being on that same wavelength i would just ask a martial artists to explore more of what is really going on right is what is that united consciousness right of what what is what are they really feeling when they get together with their martial arts friends um, outside of, again, the four walls, right? The training hall, the dojo, the dojang, whatever, the, the, the academy, whatever it is. Um, what is really going on? What are they really feeling? Why does everybody feel, why does every martial artist feel compelled to talk about martial arts 
with people, their friends and family that are not involved in martial arts? And more importantly, why do those friends and family that are not involved in martial arts, why are they so enthralled and engaged when we do start talking about martial arts, right? There's something there. And it's definitely more than just the primitive notion of being able to physically dominate another person. Everybody knows there's more to it than that. And the people that do the most disservice to themselves, to their income, to their students, is the people who go that, that route of that martial arts are just about dominating another person physically. Um, what's cool is that most uh, martial arts instructors, that, uh, school owners, that they're, they're so far from that. Um, that, that, you know, it's not even a concern, but they have to look the other way, right? All of us have to look the other way. What is that? What are martial arts doing that is helping us transcend the perils, the unhappiness, the, uh, the angry, angry thoughts and angry actions of everybody else? How come we are able to keep cool, to keep calm, to stay collected, to be emotionally stable? When the rest of the world is, you know, losing their losing their mind over the smallest things, politically, religiously, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever the news is is harping on today, is the whole world loses their mind. Yet martial artists are still able to stay centered. What is going on there? It's beyond the physical. It's beyond the mental. It's beyond the spiritual. It's the combination of those three that really allow us to succeed. Uh, you know, on, on the personal level. And when you can succeed on the, the personal level, then you're just literally one step away from succeeding on the professional and financial level. And that's what, you know, why I love what I do so much, because it's not hard work. You know, as martial artists, we believe in leverage. So it's not hard work when you have somebody who is personally satisfied, when somebody's personally happy to then move them to that next level where they're professionally satisfied, professionally happy, and their income then follows uh, soon thereafter. Uh, and it's, it's just the most fun thing in the world to do, besides actually training. <laughs> <laughs> Completely agree. Now, we've talked about where you are and where you've been, but where are you going? What's, what's in store for the future, for your training, for your business, and et cetera? So, I, first of all, I love that. Thank you for asking. Um, my vision of what I want to do, um, first of all, everybody, all of us know the martial arts industry is in deep trouble. Um, uh, it's like we're talking about Jigoro Kano before. It's, it's, it's another history repeats itself. In the modern day and age where, you know, I mean, even out here in, in California, um, I have to sometimes deprogram my children uh, based on what <laughs> the education system and the government thinks is the best thing for them. Uh, you know, if somebody attacks them to run, crawl, you know, away, not to fight back, not to stand up for themselves. Uh, and I said, you know what? You guys are physically tough. You guys can, you know, if somebody's beating on you, you know, you can take it. But what about all those other people that don't and then see you do that, right? There's got to be somebody and something that can stand up for what's actually right. I'm not talking about beating people up. I'm talking about just being able to stand up for what's morally, ethically right. And that's what martial arts does because you are confident in that area. So therefore, the martial arts industry, if you look at the amount of uh, martial arts schools, uh, full-time martial arts schools in the United States, uh, 15 years ago, there's about close to 30,000 of them. Now there's less than 15,000. That is full-time operational martial arts schools, right? So, you know, in the last 15 years, literally, we've lost 50% of uh, the entire industry, and it's not getting any better. And so my vision is, I don't mean it to sound a little egotistical, but is to save this industry. Um, it's given me so much. I mean, we didn't even talk about my, my, my health history in the, in, before I got involved in that. As, as I was dying in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with a really aggressive strain of cancer. And I fought that for three years. And I had everybody from hospital roommates die to, you know, uh, uh, to, to other people that were suffering from it, just pass away. And what brought me through it was knowing that when I am done, I am going to go back and train judo. 
right? I would read, I would look, I would watch videos, and I knew that, right? And that brought me through it. So my vision is we as an industry have to stop the infighting. We have to stop, first of all, comparing yourself to others is never a good idea. We spent a, a, a lot of time today talking about everybody's individual journey through business, through martial arts, through competition, whatever else. Every martial artist has to stop comparing themselves to everybody else. Stop comparing their styles. Stop comparing their um, uh, their win record. Stop comparing whatever else. Every it's, I've worked with so many martial artists from so many different walks of lives and so many different styles over the last several years. Not one martial art is superior to the other. They're just not. Every single one offers something important, right? So there's that. Um, that we have to stop comparing ourselves and our styles of which is the best. And as an industry, we have to band together and we have to just help people to the best of our ability. And so what I'm building towards, and we've, and this is so conveniently timed, you know, sometimes, again, you know, one of the reasons for feeling good all the time uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in what you do is because the universe, God, source energy, whatever you believe in provides opportunities. And uh, as of late, I've transformed my company into something called the Institute of Martial Education, where our mission is to fully educate martial artists on what it really takes to become a professional, right? To, to make, find that balance between income and impact so you can live the calling that to help other people. And therefore, where I eventually am looking to go with that is to be a full-blown accredited uh, career school. So when and, and bring the actual career uh, training back to what it takes to become a professional martial artist, whether you want to become a school owner, whether you want to uh, teach privately, whether you want to uh, spread it through media or wh whatever else, right? Uh, those are all things that I have done successfully uh, and uh, to, to a pretty big extent. Um, I've learned from my mistakes, <laughs> like we talked about, and I know what's important now, uh, both the path and, and the journey. And that's really what needs to happen. And that's where I'm moving is towards the Institute of Martial Education, where kids going through graduate high school instead of you know, uh, choosing to go off to a vocational school or university that they can go to the Institute and, uh, and really spend their lives doing what they love, helping people with something very, very important and uh, making a extraordinary living doing so. That's what I'm, that's, that's the mission I'm on. Mm -hmm. Well, I can certainly relate to that mission and I appreciate you for being on it. It's important stuff. As you said, we've lost a lot of martial arts schools. And one of the things that I've observed, you know, back of the napkin sort of math, because there isn't great data on this, the United States has half the participation of martial arts as the world. You know, if you look at global participation, we're half of that. And we're considered to be a hotbed of martial arts. Well, we're really not. I think we just have some excellent martial artists who know how to get in front of a camera. <laughs> I think so too. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, Europe, I mean, if you look at um, even the statistics of, of uh, sp actual, uh, maybe not activity participation, but sport participation, judo in Europe is second only to soccer, you know? Um, so uh, it, it, there's a lot of people out there that, um, that understand everything we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if people want to find you and what you've got going on, of course, we're, we're going to link to your past episode, episode 401 at whistlekickmarshalartsradio.com. But what are the links if anybody doesn't want to you know, travel around and give you, give, give them the high points? Where can they find you? Yeah, listen, waythewarrior.org, waythewarrior.org. That is where I am. That is where my team is. That is where my company is. That is where the Institute of Martial Education is at this point. Um, uh, we offer, uh, I send out a, a, daily, a daily email, right? Every single day I send out an email um, with professional martial arts uh, uh, tips and, uh, and philosophy on uh, finding that balance between income and impact uh, as a martial artist, 
Uh, we have a free training uh, right right there on waythewarrior.org. Uh, usually we sell it for $200, $300, but it's a really robust training on, on how experienced martial artists can make $100,000 a year teaching high-end clients, be it through high-end private lessons if you don't have a school or that and through group lessons, uh, charging appropriately because, listen, every martial arts school is uh, just based on inflation is still woefully undercharging, but they just don't know how to frame and articulate it to justify the price of and value that they're offering. So we just show you how to do that. We are an institute. Uh, we show you how to do that for free and you can just log in and you get my daily tips and advice and you know, we'll give you that training for free. And uh, if you want our help to implement everything and work with us, all the information is there as well. So waythewarrior.org. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you coming back. I must have been nice to you the first time. And I'd love for you to share some, some parting words, you know, as we head out, what, what's the last thought you want to leave the listeners with today? Wow. We talked a lot, of, uh, a lot about a lot of different things today. Um, I think what I'd like to leave everybody with is something I brought up before and just to hammer at home is that. As martial artists, we are so used to following our individual path that we do forget we're part of a bigger family. Again, it doesn't matter what style, uh, what art, uh, what cultural uh, background. Martial arts is martial arts is martial arts. The physical, the mental, and the spiritual aspects of it transcend the tactics or techniques that are unique to each, each individual style. And so my parting words is cross-train. Um, do not be closed-minded. Um, every art has its own, uh, again, uh, uh, cultural background, uh, its own philosophy. Uh, you know, do your best to explore and uh, do whatever it takes to invest in your education. I think that's, that's the most important thing is if you are a serious and dedicated martial arts artist, you will do, and you will spend whatever it takes to further your own personal development, right? To find your enlightenment. And a lot of people ask me at this point, and this is funny too, um, because even when I, you know, had that giant business and whatever else, my, my friends from childhood used to make fun of me. They're like, Dude, you don't spend any money on anything. You still wear the same dirty judo gi every day. You know, you you still you don't drive any fancy cars. You know, you don't do whatever else. You take nice vacations. You live in nice places. But you know, it seems like you are always relaxing. I said, yeah, I'm spending that, leveraging that money to find the free time to increase my education, so I can give back to my students and give back to the next generation of martial artists. And you can't do that without money. Right. And so you guys, every martial artist needs to find that balance between income and impact. And the only way you do that is you need to spend whatever you have to educate yourself, whether that is take private lessons with your instructor, whether that is sign up for multiple martial arts schools, whether that is start your journey uh, and in education on, uh, on the business path of things. We're here to help, like I said before. Um, but, uh, you have to take this seriously because everybody who's listening to this, I know, and Jeremy, you know, and they all know, like we've been saying, there's something more to all this than just kicking, punching, choking. And so find the balance, everyone find the balance, income and impact. I love talking to other martial artists. I love learning from them. I love hearing their stories. I love the differences and the similarities between their journeys and my own. And I really appreciate when they're so open about the things that they've done, the good, the bad, all of it. Thank you, Professor Pizzo, for coming on the show and giving all of that and so much more to everybody listening today. I'm honored. You can find photos and links and everything else at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember, this is episode 418, and you can find the stuff that we sell, the other projects we're involved in at whistlekick.com. If you do make a purchase, use the code podcast15 to get 15% off.
Our social media is pretty straightforward. It's at Whistlekick. And you can find us on YouTube, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and honestly, some other places that we don't hang out too much. But we're there. My personal email address is jeremy at whistlekick.com. And I write back to every single email I get, even the ones that I don't want to. (laughs) Sometimes life and business is about doing things you don't want to do, isn't it? Well, this show is something I love to do. And I thank you for tuning in today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 